particularly real estate. And then uh, towards the half, uh, you know, first, after, probably after one third of the uh, talk, I'm going to tell you about the platform, EJU platform itself, uh, and also our ongoing work in uh, Mosaic, which is uh, a, a purpose-built real estate uh, digital wallet that we that we started working on after um, uh, the EJU platform. So, so what do we do at the Cybersecurity Research Lab? Uh, my academic background is in cryptography, and after a few years uh, in the industry, I'm now uh, more financial industry more uh, specifically, I'm now uh, focused um, on the applied information security and privacy uh, side of things more broadly. So specifically, my focus has been on uh, cryptography, classical, quantum, hybrid, agile, blockchain technology, adoption framework on the management side of things, uh, barriers, uh, scalability of it, how it can be used in security on the more technical side of it security of Internet of Things, and more recently, I'm focusing on the human-centric side of cybersecurity. Uh, but today, I'm not going to talk about most of these topics. Uh, I'm going to talk about on blockchain uh, applications of blockchain technology in real estate. Um, I have uh, many publications in the you know, areas that I mentioned, but the product that I'm most proud of from my lab and my academic career uh, are, are my trainees. Uh, the trainees that I've trained in the cybersecurity research lab, uh, who hopefully, uh, who have, those who have graduated and the current ones, will join the cybersecurity industry. And the, the lab currently has 22 uh, uh, members, mostly students, graduate students, and, and researchers. Another point I'd like to talk about, mention about the lab is that, uh, the, is the collaborative nature of most of our projects. Uh, I closely work with an industry partner, and you see their logos to the right, um, right here, uh, which reminded me that I need my annotate. Um, right here, these are you know all my industry partners. Uh, some of them are for profit, some of them are non profit uh, agencies. So I work closely with them to uh, you know from the inception of a project to ideate what the problem is that they want to be solved, um, and then we move on to actually solving it and. Throughout all of that uh, process, we uh, keep a very close uh, uh, dialogue on ongoing to make sure that our uh, solutions are meeting their requirements. Um, which, by the way, is not what happened for this project. So at the end, when I'm reflecting on it, you'll see how I deviated from this very main, uh, main principle uh, that I usually follow. And then we were also um, so lucky that we've had so many funders from federal as well as provincial um, uh, agencies. So myself and my team are really grateful for all the support that we've received from these companies and these agencies. Uh, next, I'd like to tell you about uh, why real estate, like all of a sudden from cryptography, like why, why real estate? Okay. So the Canadian real estate market has been growing very, rapidly and and those of us in Toronto know it those of us in Vancouver British Columbia know it and others have <laughs> heard about these two cities as well um so uh, increasing the the rapid growth of uh, the, the the cost uh, prices of housing in Toronto and Vancouver have made housing affordability a major concern and uh, in in general so the key points that I'd like to include uh, on this slide is that transaction costs uh, in Canada can range uh, somewhere between, you know, anywhere between 11 to 22% of the total purchase. 22% is really high, okay? And $2.8 billion, Canadian dollars, from companies has entered, in this case, uh, in the GTA, so Toronto real estate markets since 2008. That's, that, that doesn't sound healthy. It doesn't contribute to a, necessarily to a healthy uh, ecosystem. So there are numerous reports uh, that indicate that fraud is a serious problem in the Canadian real estate market. And uh, so, so what happened exactly that I really got into this? Um, I had a personal experience in 2016. I'm going to tell you uh, more about uh, in a moment. But in 2017, the Ontario uh, government uh, announced this uh, Affordable Housing Act, which included, uh, you know, 16, includes 16, if I remember correctly, 16 rent and housing reform actions. Um, 
in April of 2017. And there was a lot of media coverage. I have another slide that shows some of the media coverage um, that delved into this. And it included, uh, you know, works around, we need to understand what's going on in terms of real estate fraud. And we need to do something to stop it. Uh, and specifically, they refer to paper flipping and other types of uh, speculation and double ending as a fraudulent activity. Double ending in itself is not fraudulent necessarily in some jurisdictions. I'm going to talk to you, uh, tell you a little bit more about that. But in some jurisdictions, uh, it is uh, prohibited. So in Ontario and uh, BC at the time, it was not prohibited. But when it was used to maximize the agent's uh, commission at the price of, um, you know, the the seller or the buyer losing an opportunity unfairly, then it becomes a fraudulent activity. Okay, so they really wanted this um, uh, the sixteen actions in the Ontario housing um, affordability housing act. They really wanted to make sure that uh, the rules in the real estate ecosystem that governs the agents and the process as a whole ensures that consumers, the sellers, the buyers are fairly represented. And there's, there was enough evidence to prove the contrary. And uh, I'll show you a, a bit of that as well. So this is basically why we started the EJU project. And it was designed, EJU as a platform, it was designed to address these shortcomings um, in the real estate industry and to protect the Canadians uh, on their most significant investment in their in their lives, right? If you think of it, if you purchase a house on average in Toronto, houses are, I think um, I read recently about a million dollars. Like how much money are you going to make in your entire uh, career? Probably it's not, you know, on for average people, it's not going to be more than that. So it, it's huge. But before we get into uh, the, you know, details of EJOR, let's see, uh, the problem a little bit more closely and what exactly happened in 2017. And I promise that I tell you what happened to me personally that I got interested in this as well. So here on the, on the right, you see a screenshot of what was captured like a, as an illustration in Globe and Mail a newspaper. Uh, it was an article from April, 2017 that it, basically details a, a, a very common scenario for a 2016, 2017 over asking type of transactions, real estate transactions, illustrating paper flipping fraud, okay? There's no ifs, buts, this is fraudulent, right? Uh, because the, as you see, the, the agent who's represented by this guy in the black tie is getting income off the records. Uh, they're not paying uh, income tax on that income. Also these uh, dummy buyers, buyer number one and two, same thing. And at the end, buyer number three, uh, sorry, buyer, buyer number three is not paying uh, property tax um, uh, to the province on the actual price that they pay. They only pay however buyer number one uh, promise. Uh, so, so there's just multiple avenues of fraud illustrated in this Global MA article from 2017. This is on the left. This is a CBC marketplace. Um, I, I, I took the screenshot uh, from their website, but there was actually a CBC marketplace uh, episode that uh, the journalist went, uh, you know, hitting cameras and talked to, you know, uh, impersonating, representing themselves as potential buyers, talking to the agent who was representing the seller, and they caught the agents on camera and these they had targeted these agents because they were um, you know famous agents in the GTA area uh, you know with with their KPIs and they sell everything and like all all, all the famous uh, um, key performance indic indicators for the real estate for hot real estate agent in, in that area like in, in, in that time frame and you see there's a, there's a, a the code I can inform you of what's happening with the price. Um, another broker said, um, uh, I, I, can, I, I can actually tell you about the um, amount of the co competing buyer's bid. So you just a little bit over that and then you win. So this is the fraudulent activity that, it, that has happened. Okay. And interestingly enough, just a year before in 2016, I was selling my first house um, to relocate because I got the Ryerson job. 
And I was nearly a victim of double ending pride myself. Okay, so I had personal experience with this, uh, which really makes this real when you hear the, uh, the Premier of Ontario talks about it as, as, as a problem to be addressed and all the media coverage. So uh, I was lucky because uh, I caught uh, what was going on and before it was too late, but it really proved to me that there is a problem in the system that this is going on and they have the audacity to do this as, as they do. So what are the vulnerabilities? So this was you know, some uh, anecdotes, but let's actually look at the vulnerabilities and the opportunities for fraud. Paper flipping, double ending, tax fraud, uh, lack of transparency, which you know, basically fosters all of that. So what are these? Um, about one third of homes bought in Canada are purchased from a builder, okay? Uh, however, there's currently no system in place, overarching system in place to register the ownership of pre-construction homes, condos, townhouses, or anything. And paper flipping happens during the time where you sign for your rights to that uh, uh, pre-constructed um, piece of uh, real estate um, until you actually register for it. There's usually you know, a few years, as, lo as long as five years in between. A lot changes your personal life changes. Like maybe, maybe you, know, you start a family, you, you don't want a condo anymore. So, uh, so a, lot, a lot can happen in five years uh, in particular, a lot of fraudulent activities with paper flipping happen. So um, um, property scalpers, uh, people who speculate that the prices are going to go up, write, start the, these contracts with the builders, with uh, condo builders, townhomes, without the intention of ever closing the deal. And they flip those papers closer to the deal at a much higher price. Okay, Again, they're not paying any uh, tax uh, income, um, income tax or um, the eventual buyer who closes deal is not per, is not paying property tax to the builder. They need to pay some to the uh, you know authorities, uh, the province. They need to pay some. None of that would. There's opportunity for none of that to happen. There are cases that those also happen, but there's clear opportunity and anecdotal evidence that this has been going on, and um, it's it's uh, it's it's a problem. It's a fraudulent activity. Double ending, which I'm going to spend some more time on, uh, is, uh, so the, as I said, double ending in itself doesn't need to be a fraudulent activity. It is allowed by law in some provinces, for instance, in Ontario. Uh, but in other jurisdictions, such as Alberta, it has been a fraudulent, it, it has been created not possible for a very long time. So at the time, when you looked at this, it was still a um, um, uh, a, a prominent activity in most Canadian jurisdictions and also in, in, in the US. So, so the fraud occurs when a broker represents both the seller and the buyer and withholds some um, higher bid that is being represented by another agent so that their own buyers are presented to the seller and the seller um, doesn't know these other higher bids and goes with the uh, buyer that is being represented by their own agent. So the agent gets double commission, okay? Um, tax fraud, that's, uh, you know, um, obvious. Uh, when we have uh, property scalpers and a lot of, um, you know, companies, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of avenues for, for fraud. Transparency, so lack of transparency in the process in general, we're gonna talk about it a little bit more, uh, is going to, uh, you know, foster some of these uh, fraud related activities and uh, is really made worse by the fact that there's uh, a, a, a only a paper trail, mostly a, a paper trail for a lot of what's going on. And it's hard to audit those and it's really time consuming uh, and, and resource intensive as well. So the opacity and the relaxed regulations um, uh, of the Canadian real estate markets um, largely contributed to that, uh, uh, through the problems that we're seeing. Um, uh, but, you know, the, you, people will take issues with what I just said, that these are uh, rather relaxed regulations. Uh, if you watch the, the um, uh, CBC marketplace, they actually interview uh, one of the, I'm not going to name them or the organization, 
uh, the organization who's uh, responsible to fine um, the agents who commit double ending fraud or any other fraud. And then they say, you know, the, uh, the actual fine is about $15,000 or something. If you look at the amount that they benefit from every single transaction that they double end, they're happy to pay the $15,000 price. So, you know, this needs to be a little bit more tightened. So what are the problems? Uh, what are the errors that allow, what are, what, why, what is, what is, what is the system not doing well that allows for these issues? So there are some opportunities for errors because these are paper-based, okay? And there's lack of interoperability. So um, most real estate agents um, bring you the contract as a seller or, or buyer on paper, then they, it goes to your, the broker, then it goes to your real estate lawyer on paper, it's couriered to them. Then it goes to the bank from your lawyer's office again in paper. Then it goes to the appraiser again in paper. A lot of opportunities for things to go wrong and be hidden and, and that lack of transparency definitely doesn't help. You, you should question like who is um, feeding off of that lack of transparency when we're going to show a technology that can not only streamline and make this more efficient, but also uh, make, bring more transparency to all of this. And then lack of interoperability. As I mentioned, uh, the systems are designed really desperately. Um, so uh, the system that the real estate lawyer uh, works with, the information system that they work with, does not inter it doesn't help with any integration, does not integrate with the bank system or with the um, appraiser system or with the condo builder system, with the real estate agent broker system, like these are really um, completely separate uh, um, and uh, disjoint systems that were designed by these stakeholders uh, for their own benefit and for their own, you know, to achieve their own goals. Um, it, it, none of them were designed with interoperability in mind, and it, it doesn't help. It definitely doesn't help, and it, it, it introduces um, a lot of avenues, a lot of opportunities for, for, for error, and in turn, for lack of transparency and fraud. So after my personal 2016 uh, um, experience, and then the 2017 Media Coverage and the Housing Reform Act with the Premier of Ontario, who at the time was, you know, uh, university's report to uh, College of uh, University and, and, and Ministry of uh, Universities and Colleges and the Premier. So it was my boss's 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 boss who said, we'd like to understand this and look for solutions. I said, I can help. Let me, let me, let me see what I can do. So I assembled a team. And at the time I was looking at blockchain and uh, applications in the finance because I came from the financial industry and I was already working when I was in the industry, I was working on anti-money laundry, uh, KYC, know your client applications of blockchain technology in the finance. And, and I said, okay, so let's see if we can do something with blockchain in the real estate. So uh, uh, I assembled a team and you see all their names and you see from, it goes from 2017, 18, 19, 20, 20 to 21. And you see how rapidly it grew. And you know, 2020, we had a, a, a very big team. It basically constituted half of the cybersecurity research lab. Um, and then um, over the summer, we had more students. I anticipate this summer we'll have more students. So our 2021 numbers are going to go um, close to 2022 numbers as well. Uh, at some point, we had uh, help from uh, our Office of Research um, and Innovation uh, our commercialization expert, uh, Mr. Vigen Nazarian, uh, to uh, put together an NSERC application for I2I for commercialization of the idea. So a lot has happened, a lot, the team has, has grown and a lot of things to report. I have about you know, 20 minutes left to tell you all the highlights. If you'd like to mo know more about the details on the design, uh, on the um, impl uh, implications, on the implementation, I'm providing some resources for you to look and I'm happy to uh, have a one-on-one -on -one with you if, if you'd like to know more, but for the most part, I'm going to tell you the story and how it all came about and the highlights of our, uh, uh, of our achievement and our contribution without going to too, too much detail because there's a lot to share. So more importantly, I'd like to acknowledge my blockchain uh, research and development team. So I think these are all the pictures. Uh, if I missed anybody, I apologize. 
Um, so just a moment to acknowledge the great work that they've done. Everyone in the blockchain um, research and development team that I have assembled, they're they're really highly motivated and, and, and highly collaborative. I have a highly collaborative team. Um, during the summer uh, where we had the COVID and we had to put up a structure to work from home, uh, we had daily standups, just like any traditional development team. And these were uh, led by uh, Dave McKay, who's our technical lead. And it really greatly helped everyone uh, with, with, with you know, uh, helping uh, not just the team, but also Getting the, to the get, getting to used to this uh, COVID work from home routine and being able to meaningfully contribute to something and not be um, you know uh, feeling lonely or anything because of COVID it really helped me uh, the structure that I had in the lab it really helped me so I hope that that holds true for the rest of the members as well so most of uh, the members that you see their pictures in in in, in this um, uh, in this slide are still with the lab. Some of them started as undergraduate, part-time undergraduate students, and they came back as graduate students. Uh, most of them are soon graduating. So if you're looking for uh, somebody to hire in the industry or as a grad student, let me know. I have some good ones to recommend. Uh, they have either computer science background or business technology background. So let me know if you're looking for good uh, students to hire. So let's look at... Uh, why we're focusing on real estate above and beyond the story, the backdrop of all of this. Why did I think that uh, real estate was actually uh, the first industry to try out as opposed to supply chain, which we're working right now, or, or finance or other ones that I will uh, briefly tell you about. So uh, in the next slide, I'm going to tell you more about Azure, okay, that addresses these shortcomings in the real estate. But it's also important uh, to, to tell you that we're basically uh, uh, feeding off of uh, a momentum that already existed before 2017, and it continued to grow during these past uh, couple of years. So these companies that you see on, on, on the right, uh, they've done a lot of um, you know, development in real estate, whether on the process side or uh, tokenizing some of the assets. So mostly on the tokenization of the assets, not so much on, 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 the, on the process itself. But it's important because uh, it's, it's important to have that ecosystem because then you see what is it missing that we can contribute to as opposed to start with something from completely from scratch and, and uh, you know, be the loner for quite a while. So we saw that although there's a lot of activity going on from these companies, um, there are no um, overarching digital wallet that handles the identity, digital identity for um, uh, you know, these or other uh, blockchain-based uh, solutions, So, which is our Mosaic, which we'd like to basically address and contribute to the industry by our Mosaic project, which I'm going to tell you more about towards the end. So it's important to acknowledge the ecosystem that we're not the only ones working on this and, uh, it, it, you know, working hand in hand with some of these uh, projects and seeing how um, these other initiatives and how our contribution is going to help complement those. I think it's a very important observation and point to make. So last but not least, I told you close to, uh, you know, the, mid, uh, the middle of the talk, I'm going to tell you more about Azure specifically. So the background has ended, now I'm going to tell you about Azure. So uh, Azure, we said it's equitable, smart, unified real estate platform. And this slide is telling you why we named it such. Um, smart property ledger, it's uh, one of its component. Transparent bidding blockchain, it, it, blockchain is another component. And pre-construction contract registry, PCR, is, uh, is, is uh, the last component. So it has these three components. Um, I'm going to tell you about the architecture, some of the technology stacks, um, uh, where the publication uh, stand for any of them, where the implementation stand for any of them. And uh, once we cover all of this, then I tell you about the digital wallet, which is Mosaic that complements this because even these three together, we're not completely addressing some of the needs that I had um, pointed out early on. Okay, so let's talk about uh, transparent uh, blockchain, uh, TBB, uh, PCR and SPL, smart property ledger. So. In the next three slides, I'm showing some flowcharts. The intention is not for you to actually read these flowcharts, okay? I'm 
including them so you know so I tell you what we did. So we started with, in 2017, 2018, we started with uh, mapping the actual process that was happening in the real estate uh, to business flow chart because we needed to understand exactly what was going on before we could uh, address the lack of transparency or uh, interoperability, right? So before we do that, we had to map them in, into flow charts. So these are business processes. As, as, as you expect them to be, okay? Uh, we focused uh, from, you know, the jurisdiction that we live in, in Ontario, and then we looked at uh, British Columbia and other jurisdictions in North America. So with the caveat that double ending is actually uh, completely illegal in some jurisdictions such as Alberta, the rest of the shortcomings <laughs> were common to all, most of the, um, uh, your jurisdictions in North America. So that's that's bad <laughs> because uh, it, it means that the shortcomings are everywhere, but it's good for our research because it helps with the generalizability of the work that we've done, okay? So what is TBB trying to achieve? TBB is trying to uh, design, we designed it uh, trying to achieve uh, uh, transparency of recording all the bits, so double ending. So it would, it would be a deterrent for somebody who wants to do double ending fraud, okay? So, or even property uh, scalping uh, to, to some extent. So it enhances communication efficiency between all of these different uh, stakeholders that you see, seller, their agents, buyer, their agents, and the actual blockchain. Um, and uh, it provides an auditable record for uh, all the actions activities and that audible record is going to act as a deterrent okay um and uh not just a deterrent actually we've designed it so that the bids the the actual seller as an example is notified automatically on the app on their phone or or or, or, or the um notification on their desktop that a bid was just um you know recorded so they're not at the mercy of the real estate agent to get notified about a bid. So it just by design solves, addresses the double ending fraud. Double ending is still possible, but it's, it cannot be fraudulent because then you're not, the agents don't have that, that much power. So dual agency is not going to uh, provide this imbalance of power, if you will, okay? The next one is the pre-construction uh, registry. So this is for the cases of pre-construction. Again, I just have the um, um, flow charts for you to see that we've actually done the work of mapping. The intention is not for you to read because these are uh, not really legible. I have a uh, sort of uh, slides that shows the states uh, for these. And I tell you exactly what I want you to um, uh, get from this, you know, the, the proof of concept implementation or the design that we did for for any of these in the next few slides. So, and this is for smart property ledger. Again, we mapped everything. And in this one, you see that uh, it, it gets really crowded. So you have the buyer, the seller, uh, the their respective banks, their respective lawyers, and even an appraiser. Like it's, it really gets messy, okay? So, but these are the theoretical um, contributions that we had in 2007 to 2018. We started writing uh, theoretical design papers based on these, I'm gonna tell you, a success story based on one of them. Uh, as the publications were going through the process of reviewing, and those of you in academia, you know that that can take some time, I assembled the team uh, to develop some of these. So in 2019, I wanted to know if these actually work, right? So if I can actually showcase some of these designs in the form of proof of concept. So together with my team, we built a proof of concepts to support our theoretical uh, work. And these are uh, screenshots of the, uh, the posters that were presented in a December 2019 research exhibit that we held together with the desktop that was you know, beside um, uh, the presenters, my students who were presenting these posters, um, showing the interface, how you would log in and what would be your interface if you were a buyer, what would the lawyer see, what would the agency and so on and so forth. Okay, in building, so you see there's, there's not much flowchart in here except for this, this one on the TV, TV front. 
uh, there's a lot more and you see these state diagrams and these are the uh, interfaces um, that are basically counterparts to the flowcharts and the tech stacks. In, in building the POCs, we found better ways to represent the state of data and the transactions. And that's why you're seeing these states here, okay? So it really evolved. The theoretical work really evolved into a state-driven way of uh, presentation. And I'm going to tell you more about that as well. So let's talk about the architecture and build of uh, these uh, in, in general and, and these um, POCs one by one before I tell you how, it, how we ended up with a digital wallet. Okay, so we have a front end surprise and we have a back end surprise. <laughs> the front end does what it's supposed to do. It's the interface between us and the, the back end and the uh, end user. And um, uh, the back end is our application server, which is responsible uh, for communicating with the non blockchain databases and the mail server performing application logic and processing data before it is given to the blockchain. Okay, and for blockchain, which is also backend, uh, we use Hyperledger Fabric, which supports, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the blockchain uh, implementation that we had at the end, re recording all the bids, uh, recording all the pre-construction uh, registries, reporting, uh, recording the smart property ledger rec uh, records, basically. Okay, so this, this is uh, how, we, how we design, architect the entire thing for all three of the platforms, uh, components of the user platform, okay? So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about each one now, okay? So TBB, Transparent Bidding Blockchain, it tracks property bids made by uh, potential buyer's agents and it allows the sellers to see the bids placed on their property without any middlemen, okay? Without the broker, without the agent in between. Uh, the agent is there doing their job, but you can be sure that the seller, if they choose to, they're actually seeing everything. You know, they don't, they, they're not really left at the mercy of their agent to be informed about that. So this added transparency assures the seller that no bit information is being withheld from them, enabling them to make informed decisions. Uh, a victim of double ending fraud can't do that. Okay, so we have the uh, system architecture uh, in this work. We had the web app that calls and puts the information on the blockchain. Um, and this system is going to prevent fraud because of what I just explained. And how users personally identifiable information, PII is protected. That's really important, right? If you do all of these design to make sure you give transparency, but it's too much transparent <laughs> by giving out uh, personally identified information out, oh, that's not good, right? So we had to um, take good care about um, that aspect of this as well. And then uh, in the next slide, I, I'd like to show you the state uh, of the information that I told you about. So here you see this automated state diagram that starts from the starting point and then it has this ending point. And whenever you have uh, a, a property, that is registered to be on the system, uh, it starts with, it's not for sale yet, and then it gets listed. Then it's a, a listed property. You have all sorts of viewings and then all sorts of bids. It stays in this loop, in either of these loops, until the seller selects a bid, okay? Uh, a final bid, and then the bid is selected and, and it ends. And then from this on, we travel to the next uh, platform, which is the smart property ledger that actually handles the, um, the actual transaction, which has the banks and the lawyers involved. In this case, we don't have the lawyers because it's between the sellers and the buyers and their agents, okay? Now, what are the implications? As I said, uh, it has a uh, strong information security and transparency. Uh, it, deter it, it, it makes some fraudulent activity impossible by design, but also works as deterrent. Uh, it reduces the transaction cost because of all the efficiencies that it, that it um, uh, results in. Uh, the success story is that uh, the paper that was submitted um, <laughs> in the work that we started in 2017, the paper was submitted in 2019, it was accepted in 2020, and it was 
published last week. <laughs> How timely. <laughs> so it was published in uh, Journal of Database Management, which is ranked A in the Australian Business Dean's Council ranking. And I would like to acknowledge uh, the significant contributions from all my co-authors and the team that I highlight here. Oh. In particular, I'd like to show you one name uh, here, <laughs> uh, Dr. Victoria Lemieux, who is chairing these meetings as well, whose expertise in secure record management greatly improved uh, this paper. Also, uh, the reviewer, so when we submitted this, it was about the theoretical design. And the reviewers uh, said, well, great design, but how do you show that it actually works? How do you show us, how do you convince us that it's actually effective? Um, and, and, and we had some choices uh, to make, either empirically validate this, for instance, uh, take it to a focus group of experts or end users, show them the design, get their um, you know, feedback uh, and go that route. I think that would have uh, given rise to an entire different or separate complementary paper. Instead, we invited my, one of my existing collaborators, uh, Dr. Uh, Schufel from, from uh, Varsho School of Economics, who proved the efficacy of TBB, uh, that it actually works um, by his implementation of an agent-based modeling system uh, that showed, you know, these are, we, we basically simulated all these parties as agents, sellers, buyers, uh, selfish real estate agents um, parameterize everything and let the system run. And the system ran, you know, uh, millions of times. And we, have, we, we are reporting about the results in the paper, uh, how, how it uh, basically um, uh, plateaus into something that we want, as opposed to without TBB, how these actors would have all acted. So it actually proves the efficacy of our design using agent-based modeling. Last but not least, um, Dave McKay, uh, the technical lead at our cybersecurity research lab and my students at the cybersecurity research lab who implemented uh, because the, uh, the reviewers also asked about, have you actually implemented this? And by the time they asked for it, we had already done it. So we included some of the um, uh, screenshots that I'm sharing uh, in here in, in the paper as well. Okay, so I told you a lot about uh, TBB because that paper has actually been published now. <laughs> the other ones are in the process of um, being written and implemented and so on and so forth. But um, the actual POCs have been, written, have been implemented. So uh, pre-construction registry, it has been um, uh, implemented. We're now writing the paper. It basically uh, solves the paper flipping uh, uh, fraud because it sheds light into all of those instances. And how does it do that? Through this uh, state diagram. So again, you start with something um, and uh, this is uh, you getting into a contract, signing a contract with a, a condo builder. And then you have the agreement, it goes through some loops and then you pay your deposit in chunks, obviously. Uh, and then you have uh, a waiting time, a long waiting time, usually between the agreement and deposit being paid. It's a year, depending on how early you sign up uh, or late you sign up. Um, and then you, there's a waiting game and then you get occupancy. When you take occupancy, you might not already own the building because the rest of the building is still being built. The ownership is at a later point in time. There might be actually as long as six months or close to a year between these two states. So all of this we have implemented and we're happy to share in that paper. So what are the implications of the PCR? Well, the proof of concept model that we have shows uh, that we have automatically enforced terms of a purchase and in turn reduce fraud in the process, okay? So this benefits all parties who are at risk currently and the real estate market as a whole. It just provides for, for a healthier, smarter, uh, an equitable, if you will, real estate uh, market in general. So last but not least, we have the smart property ledger, which let's say you have your condo and it's built, you wanna take ownership or the bidding is over, now you wanna take ownership. And these are the states, okay? So we have, uh, you're waiting for the appraisal to take place and then you get the mortgage. So the banks are involved, obviously your lawyer is involved from the very beginning. 
then you close, then the transfer of the funds, the keys. So all of this happens in one day and people have to pay fines every day because this cannot happen in one day. There's a domino effect when something goes wrong when papers are being careered from one office to the other, like from one, two, three, four, five offices to the other ones, right? But if it's just a matter of uh, checking the funds on a blockchain that can be automated through a smart contract, click, 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 this can happen in a matter of an hour or even less, okay? So there's a lot of uh, incentives for everybody to be doing this and we'll see why they're not doing it. So what are the implications where uh, yeah, we're more transparent, it's so simple to audit, okay? And we have a single point of truth. You do not need to re reconcile between the records from the lawyers, the agents, the um, appraisers, all of that, which a lot of people are paid just to do that currently, right? So a lot of people who are working in these offices are doing these manual work. Human beings are prone to error, right? And a lot of reconciliation, a lot, a lot of effort goes into that reconciliation. So I'd like to show you some of the screenshots that we have, you know, to show you the proof that we actually have implemented these. Uh, so this is Smart Property Ledger, a screenshot of it. Another one, uh, again, from uh, the same uh, one, how you are creating an account gives you a, you know, this is uh, Toronto's Eaton Center. Um, uh, no, sorry, uh, Nathan Phillips Square. <laughs> Nathan Phillips Square. Um, uh, and it's saying, welcome, Nathan, because of uh, just my folks were having fun. Uh, okay, so, so these are screenshots of the actual thing that we built. Okay, so is it all done? Those three flowcharts are now implemented in standalone um, packages, platforms, uh, components of the platform. But we realized that although we have this consistent workflow, we have a huge onboarding bottleneck. All of these people from banks, appraisers' offices, lawyers, agents, brokerages, sellers, and buyers, we had to somehow introduce them, onboard them to the system. And uh, it didn't really help that we, we didn't have that. So we couldn't really showcase the power of everything that we were uh, providing, contributing to with, with, with stuff that we saw. So we said, well, anyone else has that? We could just piggyback or collaborate with them and say, do you have an identity system that is overarching, interoperable, and we can use? And we realized that no one really had that. Uh, and this was a gap. Uh, this uh, purpose built or even, um, you know, industry specific digital wallet that would not be specific to one company or one platform, a centralized one, uh, did not exist, right? So all of the solutions that did exist were really centralized. So we said, let's solve that problem too. And that gave rise to the Mosaic project. So to fix the issues that I just mentioned, we started working on Mosaic about a year ago. And this is the one that uh, received funding from NSERC I2I as well. Okay, so this can help. Um, uh, in, in, this can help any organization and a consortium of organizations interact in a decentralized environment. And and uh, I'll show you what we've built and how this can um, more specifically help with not just the real estate um, ecosystem and the usual platform, but also above and beyond that. So it's. Uh, decentralization and blockchain issues that it needs to solve. The digital wallet overview and component, I'll tell you more about it. The tech stack and what is left to build. This is really work in progress and we haven't completed it yet, okay? So um, there are some business concerns when uh, there's a blockchain implementation initiative. There's always a, 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 a self-fulfilling, you know, attraction that vendors would lock you in and say, you know, if you, our, our stuff is really great, if you wanna be part of our ecosystem, you have to use ours. And this is how, um, you know, traditionally vendors haven't been, um, uh, you know, providing interoperability. So vendor locking is not a blockchain specific thing. It's not a real estate specific thing. 
it's a technology IT provider specific thing. It's not pro-consumer, right? The good thing is uh, there's a lot of activity, a lot of um, international initiatives on interoperability and how blockchain technology can help with interoperability. Okay, so we're helping, we're contributing as a small component, as a player in this entire ecosystem who's trying to um, advance interoperability using blockchain technology uh, by, by the Mosaic project, okay? Um, so it allows any party that is part of this ecosystem to make changes, and it would also help with regulatory compliance. So let's see a little bit more about it. I'm running out of time, so I don't have a lot of time to tell you about uh, how um, the mosaic actually works. And again, it's work in progress, so I'm just going to just, uh, you know, provide you with some teasers, but it basically can work at the uh, as the foundation of the onboarding to our Azure, but not only that, it's a, a digital wallet, and you see a digital wallet here that can work in um, not just real estate, but supply chain, by ins in, in insurance claims, and other uh, scenarios that exhibit some of these uh, common characteristics when you have parties that are coming from all over the place, fragmented data that they need to reconcile and data that has a long shelf life, not a data that is you know, um, transient. You know, a record on a supply chain stays for there for a very long time and you want it to stay for there for a long time because you want to go back and audit it perhaps. Insurance claim is the same, real estate is the same. So our digital wallet, uh, uh, can actually help address that need in these other platforms as well. So um, this is uh, explaining what a digital wallet is. I just assume that you all know about it uh, and, and just talked about digital wallets and what they generally do, okay? So there are some issues with um, digital identity. So digital identity in an organization, in a bank, in a hospital, it's, it's done in a centralized way, okay? And it's important for those scenarios for it to be done in a centralized way. But now blockchain technology allows us to um, uh, think about, imagine uh, about, you know, various other scenarios when you do not want it to be done through a centralized way, okay? Um, like, why do they need to know who exactly you are uh, for, you, for them to be convinced that you've had a recent COVID test that was negative? They don't need to know who you are. All they really need to know is that they have a recent, you, you've had a recent negative COVID test, right? So there's so many examples. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to talk to you about those, but a digital wallet, that the user, the consumer has control over and decides exactly when to uh, release information and what exactly to release based on self-sovereign identity is exactly what we wanted to build, not just for real estate. Again, I, I'm repeating that for other scenarios as well, for other use cases, and that's exactly what we do, okay? So it's based on self-sovereign identity and it issues verifiable credentials that the user can basically decide who to share it with, who to share them with and when to share them, as opposed to a centralized identity. Okay, so our uh, the goal is for our mosaic uh, digital wallet to, to provide transparency, privacy, redundancy. So it's not there's no single point of failure, security, immutability, all of the good things, all of the buzzwords. <laughs> uh, but we have uh, so far been able to already achieve a lot of this, and there's some left to be built as well. Okay. Um, so here I have a little bit of uh, technical information about what we did. So we did data-driven workflows, we did template builders, we use the cloud, we are following uh, W3C standard, um, and uh, first and foremost, we're using data-driven state machines. So those of you with theoretical computer science background would remember this. So we went back to that and, and gave a, a new spin to that, a twist to that, if you will. Uh, to make it uh, useful for what we're doing here. Here I have a quick overview of our tech stack. You see Hyperledger Fabric, self-sovereign identity, some of the uh, payment uh, methodology. Again, I don't have the time to uh, show more of this, um, but um, 
this work in progress and more uh, to be said about them later. Um, the template builder is our way of uh, making sure that this is essentially um, uh, provided uh, to the consumers, to organizations who have in a very easy and user-friendly drag and drop type of uh, environment. So it's, it's really easy for them to integrate this with what they have or just come on and customize this the way they want. So this is a huge uh, development um, um, uh, initiative project that my team has been working on for quite some time now. And these are some of the examples. Um, I wish we had time for a demo. I, I, we will have hopefully a follow-up to this where I can show you more of the development specific to Mosaic and a demo where I invite the rest of my team to show you uh, these demos as well. I already told you about some of these um, um, uh, usable versatility of uh, the Mosaic digital world. So supply chain provenance, insurance claims, vehicle registry, health, Care, treatment plans. So I already told you about that. Just a slide telling you more about this. So what is left to build? Good question. So we don't have a mobile digital wallet yet. Uh, we don't have use case templates for various different use cases that I just told you. We're working on a governance framework, which is very important for decentralized governance. And uh, template visual editors, um, part of it is done, but more to be done. Um, I'd like to take a moment to reflect um, on the, this entire experience over the past uh, couple of years, and those would be my last slides. I'm mindful of the time as well. So uh, I, as, I, as I shared with you in full transparency, how this all started from real estate. In retrospect, um, and in hindsight, now I know that there's not much appetite in the real estate ecosystem to have this much transparency, because the power is <laughs> who are playing and making these decisions are actually feeding off of lack of transparency. Um, or they're being lobbied by people who would benefit. And they don't really see a lot of benefit in this, okay? The end users do. So I hear urge of the government's uh, decision makers, uh, regulators, as well as consumer advocacy teams to look into this. Why is it that um, the stakeholders who uh, should be providing um, transparency, if you, if you have a one-on-one -on -one with them, they're not going to say, oh, transparency is bad because, right? But they're not showing much appetite, okay? So this is something uh, that needs to be looked at. Uh, on the technology side, so we started this, uh, the implementation of it in 2000 and towards the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, and a lot of the technology that we started playing with was not mature enough. So we had to go back and forth. We had to redo some of this, which is, uh, which is okay because we actually contributed to the maturing, you know, the, the, the process of maturing some of these technologies. So I'm, I'm happy that I did this. Overall, that we did this, my, me and my team. Overall, I'd like to share these general reflections. So um, as I said, as, a, as an academic, um, of course, I want to publish. Uh, I'm interested in the research and I have the academic freedom. I don't worry. I don't need to worry about the business uh, picking this up and making it commercialized. Of course, I, I want it. Of course, I'm doing everything I can to make that happen. However, it's not my uh, priority. My priority um, above and beyond, obviously, uh, the, the, the papers that myself I'm being uh, judged by is the team that I build. Okay, um, so my first and foremost product is the people in my lab that I train. Um, all the highly qualified personnel that are that have been trained in blockchain R and D and are ready to be um, joining the industry. That's the most uh, um, product. This is my cuckoo clock. Sorry about that. Um, this is what I'm really proud of. This is my most proud product, if you will. On the business versus innovation hindsight that we have, uh, if I go back to 2017, will I do this again? Will I start with real estate again? Absolutely. I will do this again, uh, focusing or starting uh, with real estate to show to the next premier who says, oh, we'd like to understand and be able to counteract or stop these fraudulent activities to say, hey, we have this. 
what's stopping you from actually making a mandate that there needs to be more transparency for consumers, okay? And last but not least, this is the greatness about, uh, uh, you know, research that is so um, uh, free and it can, uh, it, it can really form into something else. And it doesn't really need to report to, um, let's say uh, a business unit who, who says this or else, right? Uh, we started with blockchain. Uh, sorry, we started using uh, application of blockchain in real estate. Uh, but then when we saw that there was not much appetite in from you know, all these uh, powerful stakeholders who would have um, had to um, implement our, our systems, we, we realized that, okay, so let's pivot to something that is even greater than this. And it has the versatility of being applied to other scenarios, which is exactly what we did. So I'm really, I'm, I'm really proud of the work that my team has done in, in Mosaic. As I said, it's still a work in progress, but I'm um, excited to uh, you know, come again and tell you more about it when it's all done, uh, showing a demo and the rest of the details on the technical side of it, because it's not just real estate. It has uh, this uh, versatile um, uh, set of applications in other scenarios that we can also share and, and, and talk to, okay? So with that, uh, I'd like to show you my last slide. So please visit us. Uh, we have a short handle for our website. The Mosaic has a page it, for itself and there's an easier video with uh, Dave McKay's voice and uh, radio voice, really deep, uh, beautiful voice telling you about uh, why, what is Azure and, and what you're trying to achieve with Azure. Thank you for your time. Adi, thank you for the fabulous journey that you've taken us on through your experience with developing Easier and, and Mosaic. It's, it's been fantastic. It's a wonderful example, I think, of critical innovation, as I like to call it, where, you know, you look at a, a trust problem in society, and then you, you, you're trying to solve that trust problem, and you bring a team, a multidisciplinary team together, and you create something that responds to that, uh, you know, to, to your critical reflections on what's happening. Um, so the, the story doesn't end, hopefully, with, uh, with those great powers that be not, uh, not responding to uh, this, you know, this, this uh, system you built and the, and the opportunity for greater transparency. Hopefully we can see, you know, the, the so can bring at some point in the future. But in the meantime, you're doing amazing things with Mosaic. Thank you. So I know we've had some chat. It's um, the way this has been configured. It's been a bit awkward for individuals who would like to ask questions to ask their questions. So um, if, if individuals do have questions, um, we're, we've gone a little bit over, but if you could just post your question to the chat or alternatively, if you want to send your questions to me or to Angela, and then I can forward them on to, to Addy for on your behalf. And, um, and you know, hopefully Addy would be open to responding to those questions since we're, we're really up against the time here. But it's been so wonderful to hear um, you know, all the detail of your journey and how you've actually gone about it and the challenges you face, which, you know, which would not be, um, would not be uh, unusual in this kind of a, yeah. And I'm trying to make sense of the chat here. Um, I can't do that, but yeah. Um, so maybe, yeah, if, if, if individuals would like to follow up with uh, questions directly to me, um, since we're, we're, I'm not seeing any questions specifically on the chat um, at the moment, and that's maybe because panelists can't, are unable to post, we'll, um, we'll get that sorted out for the next one. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, what's going on? <laughs> Are there Q&A? There's also the Q&A um, that I'm seeing now and um, it's open for questions. So do you feel free if you do have any that you really have a burning desire to have Addy respond to right now? Um, sorry, we are not able to open up the sound for those who would like to, to ask questions verbally. Um, that's uh, part, partly because so, sometimes our security, which is the way that Zoom has been configured for uh, maximum security, um, as, a, as a, you we're know, using the UBC platform, sometimes it does prevent us from doing some of those more interactive things. 
um, that we want to positively do as opposed to, you know, being Zoom bombed. <laughs> so we have, we have the same problems at Ryerson. I think everybody, everybody is trying to find a balance. Yes, that's that is it's so true, so true. Difficult to find a balance, and we struggle with that as we, you know, as Addie continues her research, and we all continue this, you know, the the path to our digital future, basically. So, everyone, um, again, we're over time, but let me just take the opportunity to thank Addie, our speaker, Addie Mashaton from Ryerson University, the Cybersecurity Lab for her fabulous work, her wonderful presentation. Thank you to um, Angela who set up, has the, has the difficult task of setting this all up. It's not easy technically, I, I realize, and she's just um, learning. And also to all of you for attending. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you've benefited. Uh, please do send your questions to me directly if you have any that you want to follow up on. So without further ado, we'll see you next month for our next blockchain at UBC monthly research talk. Stay tuned, subscribe to our newsletter if you want to learn more. Um, and uh, we'll make the link to the recording available so you can play back because there's a lot of information, great information in here. So you can uh, Very continue much. To learn. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to also thank you, Vicky and Angela, for inviting me and this opportunity and also so listen to this hour long presentation as I went on and on and on. <laughs> I, ho I hope uh, they, they got what they wanted out of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.